ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming so early. Uh, I know some of you had a, a reasonably late night last night. Uh, so this is the first breakout briefing session of the day. Uh, and today our theme is transforming sports for a digital world. Uh, and there's no doubt that the use of technology in sports is transforming the industry, allowing for the rapid rise of innovations within the sector. Uh, I will keep everything quite brief because we don't have a great deal of time. Uh, but our distinguished panels today will discuss what impact the integration of technology into the sports industry will have on fan engagement and revenue generation going forward. Uh, and with that, I would like to invite the first panel on stage. I think I'm there. So, so just some very, very brief introductions. Um, I will start at the end. Uh, Danny Marty is the Head of Public Affairs and Global Policy at Tencent, where he also serves as a member of the Tencent America's Management Committee. Uh, next to him, fellow Londoner, uh, Manoj Badali, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Blenheim Chalcot, and of course the chairman and lead owner of the IPL team Radistan Royals. Uh, next to him, uh, very nice to see you, Sandrine, uh, Kozu, sorry, I beg your pardon, uh, Zoku, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Tessa, uh, an Africa-focused sports marketing firm. Uh, next to her uh, is Alex Dreyfus, who is a serial web entrepreneur with more than 27 years' experience in the digital space. And he is the CEO of chilisandsocios.com. Uh, and then finally, uh, Don Davis, who is the chairman and founder of the Professional Fighters League and the founding partner of Revolution, uh, which is a Washington-based venture capital firm. Um, so I thought I'd kick it off really with, with a question that I, I hope will appeal to everyone and sort of give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about who you are, what your interests are. Um, it's an obvious one. What are the most promising areas of innovation in sports, tech and gaming, and where do you see the greatest potential for growth? Um, I'll start with you, Don, and then perhaps we can go down. <coughs> Again, I would encourage you to make this a conversation as best you can and um, intervene where you think it's appropriate. But Don, I'll, I'll kick it off with you. Well, maybe since I'm 60 years old and uh, was early in AOL, I'll start with an old technology. But technologies, when they go mass market, have the biggest impact. It's all named streaming. We're now connected, actually, at mass tipping point of streaming. So what we're seeing in sports is now changing everything. It doesn't matter about your DMA anymore. It used to matter about your local market, and then it used to matter about your regional broadcasting market. This is the first year they're more streaming than linear viewers in the world. So whether you're in soccer, or whether you're in basketball, or whether you're in the United States, or whether you're in Indonesia, streaming is your biggest revenue stream as a sports property. And it's now at the tipping point that it will change everything, how you're connected to your fans, and how your business model is changing. So sometimes the oldest has the biggest impact. It just takes 10 years. And that's this year. Alex, what's your uh, of course, when he, when he says soccer, he means football, the real football. <laughs> it's, in, it's important to, to say that. Um, so for us, not for us, but the, the way we, we see the, the growth in the innovation and technology uh, and how it's going to change fan engagement and most importantly, fan monetization, is we believe that most of sports property are going to become more and more uh, direct to consumer facing, meaning that very... To, to, to what said uh, Don is um, s streaming is one piece of it, but for the last 30, 40 years, fans were passive fans. They were just watching. We believe that the future of fan engagement and monetization is active fan, where a fan has a say uh, to the team, which is what we do, but most importantly, where the fans anywhere in the world, from Brazil, from Korea, from Japan, anywhere, uh, will be able to engage and actually to engage will have to spend some money uh, in, in order to achieve that. Uh, we, we think that 99% of sports fans that are not in the stadium, not in the city, not even in the country uh, of the team they support are actually under-monetized. And that's where we believe most of the growth is going to come in the next uh, yeah, 10 years. Something, what's, what's your experience or your sort of thoughts on this? I mean, you have a particularly fascinating uh, business that you're looking at. Yeah, so it, in an interesting way, Don, you're exactly right when you're talking about streaming. But on the African continent, we have a lot of infrastructural challenges. And so the way that I see it is almost like a release valve. So to give you a little bit of context, uh, the, the cost of data, Africans pay on average approximately 7% of, um, of their annual income on data. And so the affordability of data is a huge, huge problem. 
And so once that is able to be resolved, there will be an influx of um, interest, an influx of the streaming then can, can grow in ways that we can see tangible revenue. But when you're thinking about um, access to servers, for example, cost of data, those are some of the challenges that we see. But in terms of the opportunities for growth, what's really, really special about the African continent when you're talking even specifically about esports is that the culture around uh, convening is very different. So across the rest of the world, because they have cheaper access to data, everyone tends to play at home. Um, in Africa, that's not the case. They go to video gaming cafes, they're paying approximately one to two dollars every hour um, in order to play, but it creates naturally this really incredible environment where people are able to stream, but live, right? They're watching their, their um, peers be able to, to play in person. And so once we, we see some of the cost of that data come down, once we see some games actually building servers on the continent that allows for um, tangible like opportunities to play at the same parity, um, of access to internet, then we'll we'll see. I think a tremendous amount of change. Oh. Uh, actually, th th it was interesting listening to both Don and Sandrine there. I mean, Sa Sandrine talking about the, low, the structural impact of the cost of data. So, if you like, where we have a sports team, which is in India, I do remember that exact moment when Geo came into the market with five G, brought down the cost of data, just what that did to the value of all content, including sports content. And a bit like Don, I'm sort of old tech, so I've been building tech businesses now for 25 years. And so you see all these different waves and you get asked this question every year. The one I'm gonna pick is the tech of this year actually, which is AI. And you know, when you, when you talk about, when you ask a question like what's profound, you have to start I think with the definition of profound. And for me, there's only two things that really matter in sports. One is the fans and the second is the players. Those are the two most critical assets. And so Don's bang on I think with fans um, around streaming and the impact that's gonna have. But, but players is interesting as well. And when I, when I look at the advance, advancement around data and analytics and the use of AI now in terms of predictive modeling, and I look at what we're doing with our teams and the use of data in terms of getting those marginal improvements, I think that's gonna be massive as well. And the, the ability of data and the presentation of data to bring fans into understanding what greatness actually is I think it's going to be a really exciting component of the evolution of the of how we watch and and how we perform. Back. One of the benefits of speaking last is that you can agree with all the panelists. <laughs> um, you know, in addition to what was said uh, right now, I think there are a number of advancements in the technology space that will revolutionize how we participate and engage in both traditional sports and video game and, and esports. Um, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. We'll talk, talk about the whole spectrum as extended reality. We see continued developments in this space that will change over time as haptic and motion uh, uh, gesture control gets better, as tracking gets better, as hardware prices go down um, and become uh, lighter. It, we'll, we'll see more immersive gameplay both in traditional sports and being able to participate virtually, as well as in the game space. Uh, cloud gaming is a huge development. Right now, you have, of course, mobile, console, and PC. Um, cloud gaming would allow you to stream you know, high data games from any device. It could be your mobile phone, which right now would not support such a large uh, game file. Uh, or your home TV, for example, and that will bring more people onto the digital space given some limitations of current um, uh, console hardware. Uh, then you also have AI, as you mentioned, but AI in game development, AI in game testing, and also in game play. Right now we have these non-playable characters, NPCs. AI will make it more interesting to interact with these non-playable non characters in games, giving you a really unique environment. And then. The big, big one, which is a precursor to the metaverse, is cross-platform, cross-game play. Whether technology will allow you to take your digital assets and digital tokens from one game to another across platforms, mm -hmm. that will bring the digital space together. Thank you, Dan, and, and thanks for bringing us on to that, because that is, that is the next topic. Because um, I did want to talk specifically about AR and VR. I mean, I think it's a hugely exciting space. And talking to some of my colleagues, they're saying, well, we think it's probably going to be primarily 
sort of about ga a gaming platform. But Sonskin, I, I want to come to you with this because I think you're going to have a unique perspective. You know, from from your point of view, how does this manifest itself in your world? That you, how, how is it? How are we going to see it, particularly in the African continent? It's what I would say is that <clears throat> we're certainly we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, we're still in reality, reality. Right, um, and being able to, when I was mentioning a little bit about the culture, I think that that's really where the opportunity for innovation is, um, because as we see generally when you advance in technology, when you have all of these new advances that, that um, develop, a lot of times you also see the older forms of technology start to resurface as well, and so people value being in person more than they ever have, you know, especially after COVID, and so when we're able to uh, really see some of those promoters get tangible investments from the private sector and sponsorships from the private sector for them to actually be able to produce these events. I think that's where we'll see a lot of really interesting things start to happen in terms of how do you engage as a in-person streamer, right? Um, what opportunities are there in order to leverage your mobile phone to be able to interact with the person playing live right in front of you? I think that's where we'll see some really exciting advancements. Man, let's pursue that as sort of in, in terms of the business model of, of, of this side of things. And perhaps, Manoj, you could talk a little bit about what it looks like for you, or what, the way you're thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, look, AR and VR, I mean, it's a bit like Don's comment earlier about technology comes along, then it sort of takes 10 years to really, really sort of land. And I still think we're a bit in that place with AR and VR personally, as a, uh, if you like, as an investor, uh, someone that's always looking to monetize these, uh, these trends. That said, it is going to happen. It is going to get embedded. Um, you know, I, I come back to, you know, what are the basic needs that sports fans and sports players are trying to satiate? And for fans, it's that engagement. So the idea of virtual watch parties, the ideas of bring, being able to bring that live experience into the home, I find that reasonably compelling. Um, and on the playing side, again, high performance is all about getting those marginal gains. Um, and the sport that, I, that, that I'm most involved in, with, which is cricket, um, you know, one of the things we're looking at, for example, is preparation of players right before they go out to perform. And there, some of the emerging virtual recognition technology, we have a phrase in cricket, which is get your eye in, which is all about it takes you a couple of balls to adjust your eye to the position of the ball. Now, why can't you use that using technology before you go into bat? That's the sort of thing that we're looking at, um, just to get those marginal edges in the game. And Alex, so I'm going to come to you on this as well, because again, it feels like you have a very, I wouldn't call it a very different business model, but it's a unique business model. So how, how, how does it look for you? Yeah, <clears throat> I guess um, our business is actually to sell a digital asset called fan tokens. Uh, they are like my, uh, membership program or loyalty program that allows fans from all over the world to have a say, feel like connected to their favorite team. Um, and one of the things we looked at is, uh, as, a, as a benefit uh, of uh, being a fan token holder is, can I have access to the VR rights, uh, potentially on a, in a stadium or for a match? What, I, I don't have the answer to that, because what's going to be interesting, first, is the technology is objectively not here yet, uh, either to broadcast, but most importantly, to, uh, to uh, burst and, and watch it. Uh, but most importantly is who's going to own the right? Is it the league? Is it already part of the, uh, the TV packages that the leagues are, the TV are buying, etc.? So is there a shift in the next 10 years about TV rights, uh, 10, 15 years about TV rights where it's going to become more a B2C model or D2C model uh, because VR rights will be more team-based rather than um, league-based? Um, I don't know. I don't have this answer. Uh, but for sure, it's going to be interesting. Don, your, your thoughts on that? Won't be a surprise. All the companies I've been involved in, it's always about taking technology and making it invisible or easy for the consumer. So whether it's America Online, whether it's DraftKings, or whether it's Professional Fighters League, it's only about growing the audience and growing the engagement. It's not about technology itself. So, for example, at the Professional Fighters League, we have we're the first to have the smart cage. So it's sensors in the glove, motion capture cameras, but all that does give you punch speed, kick speed, real-time odds on who's winning, fan engagement on the screen. Because MMA is a sport that 50% of the people who watch another sport don't yet watch. So PFL now has all the fans of UFC 
but 50% of the fans that watch soccer or basketball or hockey or football. That's because of technology, just making it, oh, that's what's going on inside this cage. So whether it's VR or any other technology, I think it's important to remember, no consumer fan cares about that. They care about how is this game more interesting? How do I understand more what's going on here? How do I engage with this more? And the more you make that invisible or easy and bury it and bring the features to the top is the win. And the expectation, as far as I can see, is that that is now the norm. It's no longer uh, something special. Right? It's part, it, the expectation is just part of the package. It is, but too many times people say, cool technology, let's get to AI, let's get to the metaverse. That doesn't win in sports. What wins in sports is that yellow line that shows me the first down, the ball and strike with the pitch speed, these things that now become, oh, that's how I enjoy this game. So the very few aha features, those are the winning features, not this futuristic stuff that 25 years from now will be the yellow line or will be the ball and strike. And that's, I think, what we're always trying to do at the PFL, because right now, we're 50% of UFC's audience. Nobody in this room had heard of PFL probably before this morning. That's because our product is so engaging, bringing in regular sports fans to say, hey, I wasn't a big MMA fan. Huh, this is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I understand what's going on here because of the simple ways we use technology to explain what's going on in this fight. Yeah, I mean, one of the challenges, I think, with technology is that it has to maintain the connectivity, as, as Don was, was talking about. Sports is fun because you do it with friends, you do it with family, you do it as part of a, a town, a community, and technology just can't be cold and sterile. So part of the advancement is how do we keep that connectivity in the digital space? I think it's one of the reasons that video games has succeeded the way it has, because it allows you now in these massive multiplayer online games to connect with your friends, your colleagues, your family, and stay online to play a game. And in many of these games, you can now stay after you play and participate digitally in a music concert, for example. It's that socialization uh, that I think will be key to have some of these technologies really take off. Good. Well, I'm, I'm going to probe a little bit more. I mean, it's still in the theme of the business model, but I'm particularly interested in, in, in your thoughts on how technology is transforming sponsorship and brand partnerships and this sort of area. Because again, it's, it is changing, but how is it changing? And, and I'm sure you will each have your own view. Um, well done, let's start with you. Sure, I, I would separate from teams and leagues. Because like the Professional Fighters League, we're a league. So the players are under central contract to us. And all the decision making is centralized. So we can be way more innovative. If you're just a team, you're part of a league, there's a collective bargaining association, so you need three people to sign off, you know, at the EPL. You need one person to sign off at the PFL. So we can do things that are way more innovative. We were the first partner ever in America for Socius three years ago, right? And, and those are the kind of things we like to do. So we integrate, I would use just two words to answer your question. We integrate. Most sponsors still today buy 30-second ads. As weird as it seems, 85% of the sponsor spending in sports is a 30-second ad on TV. That's insane. 85%. So if you want to talk about something that should change rapidly, that should change rapidly. So we integrate. Somebody comes to us like Anheuser-Busch, Bose, two big sponsors of ours. We say, let's not sell you a 30-second ad on ESPN. How do we integrate your message in every other way? We rip out a white piece of paper and let's say, let's do everything you've thought of other than a 30 second ad. And that's where we start. So integrate would be word one. And some of that has technology, but some of it is just creativity. And the second word is global. Almost every brand today is global, yet they're still having to knit around and buy these 30 second ads in different markets. And when you start to take streaming plus integration and take that message global, everything changes. So I really come at this once again by integration and globalization and forget the 30 second ad and then sponsorship will change dramatically. Alex, you're, you're doing this as well. So um, <clears throat> we think? are on the other side because uh, yeah. we, we are the buyers. Uh, we sponsor, I think, like 100 sports property all over the world, even though the term sponsoring is a uh, is, is, is not the right one because we are partners, whatever that means. 
Uh, but yeah, we, we, we work with football teams, soccer teams, uh, NBA teams, NFL teams, uh, PFL, uh, uh, Formula One, etc. So we, we, we learn how to work with these properties to try to promote our brand and our product. Um, I, I'd say that sports is probably one of the last industry that hasn't been disrupted for the last 30 years uh, from a te technology point of view. And it's probably the one where we can be all collectively um, be the most creative uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, I hope at least, uh, because yet the, ge the game will most likely never change, except on the PFL, for example, where the game play is different. But in most traditional sports, uh, the game is not going to change. But the way we consume it uh, uh, will be. And therefore, the sponsoring or the, the way these models uh, will, uh, will evolve will change as well. Jonathan, you're, you're, you're the marketing expert. What's, uh, <laughs> how are you thinking about it? Sponsorship is a bit different in Africa because a lot of people still see sports across the continent as a civic endeavor and don't mm. really quite understand the business opportunity that is there. But what's happened over the course of the past two to three years has been really incredible. We've seen the NBA create the Basketball Africa League. We've seen NFL create NFL Africa. Um, F1 is looking at South Africa for a potential F1 race. And so all, some of these major entities are really entering into the African market in a, in a meaningful way. PFL is one of them. Um, and I'll get back to that. I have a question for you. Um, <laughs> but in a really beautiful way, we're seeing these big brands who are coming into the content and it's forcing the private sector to have to adjust, to have to recognize it as a business opportunity. And little by little, we're seeing sponsorship grow um, in a really, really incredible way. But uh, I really wanted to touch on something that you said, Don, and kind of ask you a question because first and foremost, you mentioned that we probably haven't heard of PFL since this morning, but I would say um, hopefully a lot of us have heard about the news in the past week and a half. It's incredible uh, for those of you that are not familiar. And I'm a little bit biased because I'm also from Cameroon. But ah. um, <laughs> the former UFC two-time um, heavyweight champion, Francis Ganu, just signed with the PFL in an incredibly groundbreaking deal where you have an active athlete who now not only has equity in the business, but also has a management position in helping to grow a new sector of your business, PFL Africa. Yes. And it is incredibly innovative. Um, and I would love at some point to also, you know, hear your thoughts around how you see um, leveraging PFL Africa in order to grow sponsorship on African content and how you're really thinking about that. Love to, and I'll just add two cents on it right now. For everybody who didn't see it, um, last week will be the week that MMA changed the entire market. It's the first major free agent in MMA history. We all remember when free agency changed in baseball or in soccer. <laughs> <laughs> Last week was the first major free agency. The number one pound for pound fighter in the world left UFC to come to PFL. He wasn't happy there. It takes leadership and courage because rarely do you get the best to also be a leader to show the way to others. And what he wanted to do is be able to box, not just compete in MMA, and he wanted to open up his entire country to MMA in a way that was aligned with our vision. And he wanted to be the executive chairman and have a real hands-on role in building that business. And he is an equity owner of that business, for real. And we talked 15 minutes on his economic deal. For 18 months, UFC couldn't come to agreement on his pay per fight. Took us 15 minutes. He said, they offered me X, will you pay me X? We said, yes, done. What else is on your mind, Francis? And it was everything else that he wanted to accomplish for other athletes, including minimum pay for his opponent to make sure his opponent was legitimate and strong. So last week is the beginning of the change of the MMA market and the opening up new territories, India, will be next, Africa will be next, and the true development of those markets. So thank you for pointing it out because Absolutely. even though the panel is on technology, innovation in these young sports, because MMA is a 25-year-old sport. Soccer is a 150-year-old sport. <laughs> you know, baseball in the United States, 160-year-old sport. So we all take for granted how much change has happened in those sports to empower the athletes and to give them control and freedom that hasn't happened in MMA until last week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, but Maris, let's, let's talk a bit about, um, yeah, back to the, the sponsorship and, and the branding and so on. How, how does that manifest itself? I, uh, for you? I don't want to talk about brands, but I want to find out how I invest in MMA. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, look, the answer to your question, and sort of Don alluded to this, is um, the, the rate at which we answer your question is in the hands of the marketing managers and the marketing directors and the brand managers in the big corporations. Because right now there's a lag. There's a big lag between what you can do and what we are doing. So there's no, there's no technology issue as to how you get deeper integration, how you get greater content integration. But to Don's point, we still find, particularly in India, actually, um, that most companies see sponsorship as a media buy. And until they make the leap, that a lot of brands have, which is you, you should be spending four times what you spend on the front of the shirt, on the activation of that front of the shirt, then uh, the technology is all there. And, you know, a good example for me is someone like Red Bull. Red Bull as an organization have been light years ahead of other brands in terms of how they use sport to promote their brand. Whatever you think of their brand and their product, you have to admire the way they've used content, the way they've bought properties, the way they've worked with high performance, their own, their own high performance center, uh, which is an incredible facility in Salzburg. Um, so their depth of integration into the sport recognizes that unless you do that, you don't get the return on investment that they seek. I'll shift the focus just a, a bit. Um, if we look at the history of, of marketing, of branding, it's been fairly static over time, right? Print could be newspaper, magazines, billboards, et cetera. Um, then you had TV, but still static. You're just seeing something. Uh, then we have the, the birth of kind of the commercial internet, and there's a little bit more uh, um, excitement in the space, but it's still a largely watch, sit back and watch. I think in video games, we're now seeing a much more interactive engagement with brands than we've ever seen before. So in some of our largest games, we have a number of household names from automotive to luxury brands to footwear, apparel, et cetera, where you can drop a pair of sneakers in a video game and your player can wear them, right? Your favorite shoe. You can have a car, a test drive that's about to be launched and you can be driving it in a game. You can also crash it. You can go off a cliff. You can do a lot of fun things with it. So brands are now trying to experiment. How can we work closely with consumers so they feel a connection and can interact with our brand in new and meaningful ways. Thank you. Um, and this, this will be the final question. We are, we are almost out of time. We have a, a few minutes still. Um, and, and I felt I should be uh, uh, obliged as a representative of my profession to ask, you know, we're natural warriors. What's the greatest risk here? What, what keeps you up at night? What worries you? I mean, it, we, we all get very excited about innovation, uh, the integration of tech. But there are always risks associated with every change. What worries you the most? And, and, and perhaps Alex, start with you on, on this one. Uh, it maybe perhaps isn't the right answer, but I'm genuinely not worried. I'm genuinely not worried. I think the upside is incredible when it comes to the African continent. When we are able to really help to resolve some of those infrastructural problems, I think we'll see a massive change in the adoption of gaming. Um, we have approximately 186 million gamers on the continent right now. Um, it's approximately 16% of our population. Uh, and that number has doubled in the past five years, and that's not with advancements, really, in terms of the cost of data. Uh, and so when we start to see some of those things change, it's just going to explode. Uh, and, you know, we see in a lot of different instances in India, there were approximately, in the span of six years, there was approximately 20 uh, YouTube accounts that had a million followers. And after, or a million subscribers, excuse me, and then after six years, because of the cost of data went down, there was over a thousand. And that was mm. simply just because of the cost of data. And so mm. we are um, really encouraging people in the private sector to start positioning themselves to get ready for that change. Because once it happens, I think you'll see a really, really incredible um, wave of interest and um, growth. I think in uh, soccer slash real football, uh, one of the biggest risks uh, uh, with, with the technology is how do you balance so-called legacy fans, so the people that are in the stadium, been there for 100 years, and the new casual fans uh, that are more global, more, uh, uh, that are less exclusive to one sport or to one team. Um, you need to keep in mind that actually um, a, a football fan is a fan of 4.6 teams in average, 
Uh, that's true for most of casual fans, but that's less true for the fan that lives in Liverpool and, and breathes only with his, uh, with his own team. And so the, the balance of, and with the technology, how you enhance and uh, empower somehow uh, international fan and more casual fan uh, without alienating your uh, traditional fan base. And that's going to be a big challenge. And do you have some initial thoughts on how you're going to do that? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a little bit, but no, I mean, it's, it's difficult because um, in our case, um, we, we give power to fans that are everywhere in the world to have a say in their favorite team. I'll take Juventus as an example in Italy. Uh, fans all over the world were able to vote for uh, which music do you want to have in the stadium every time there is mm -hmm. a, a, a goal. It sounds silly, but for eight years, it was the same music every mm -hmm. time in the mm -hmm. stadium. And now for the first time, it's this. Or PFL, we were able to vote uh, on the fact that um, you, you were able to choose actually the, how do you call that, when the players fight against each other. The, the matchups. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, and, and so, but there is a question is, does a fan in Korea and Japan or in the Middle East is, sh should be entitled to do that versus someone who lives uh, in, in, in the city of the team? For us, we do believe so, but I understand that sometimes it can be frustrating. Thank you. Danny, what are you worried about? in general, but specifically on this question, maybe. So, so I share my, my panelists' excitement for the future, but it, clearly the debate of our time right now is how does generative AI impact and affect the creatives in our society? What happens to the writers, musicians, um, the movie makers? So I, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that as technology continues to, to advance, that we do so responsibly, and we make sure that technology can certainly aid in uh, our storytelling, our engagement, and doesn't displace uh, these creative sector. Yeah, I think there are two things uh, that sort of worry me or that I think about a lot. I mean, one is something we think about with all of our tech businesses, which is data privacy. Um, I mean, sports organizations are going to be gatekeepers, of some of the most valuable data in the world uh, over the next 10 to 15 years. And with that comes a, a great responsibility. And I think the sports industry has to catch up to some of the standards of data protection, data privacy, data regulation that we take for granted, for example, in financial services, that's one thing. Uh, the second, which we haven't really talked about, is the role of the governing bodies. Uh, I mean, we have to recognize that sport, certainly the biggest sports, and cricket's the second most popular sport in the world, um, the governing bodies are still the gatekeepers of an awful lot of what's possible for players, what's possible for fans, and what's possible for teams. Um, and until the governing bodies embrace technology change that we talked about today at the rate that they need to, until they understand what's possible and bake that into their rules, bake that into their presentation, bake that into their production, bake that into their fan experience, actually, we're somewhat constrained in terms of what we can do uh, as outside investors and outside team owners. And on the, the, the final thought for you. I think most people here the entrepreneurial spirit, and our builders. And for us, technology and innovation is only opportunity. It's only opportunity. All right, well, I'm going to draw the first panel to a close. Um, obviously, we've uh, not had a great deal of time, so I would encourage you uh, to come and introduce yourselves and have a, a private conversation. Uh, most of our panels come an awfully long way, so please do take advantage of that. But otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will be going straight into panel two, uh, and if I could ask uh, the members of the second panel to come up. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll say a few words quickly uh, as they're coming up. Uh, our next theme is the future of uh, mega sporting events. So obviously interest in signature and sports mega events has emerged as an increasingly important component of local and national development agendas. Uh, as emerging nations have increased their investments in productive infrastructure and human capital, attention is focused on the role of large-scale sporting events can play in advancing social and economic outcomes. I would like to welcome our second batch of panellists. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, and let me introduce, yes, from left to right, uh, I suspect you need no introduction, but anyway, Nasser al Qasr is, of course, um, <laughs> a 
among many, many roles. I suspect you know him best as the CEO of the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022. Uh, you'll have seen some of the legacy, it's unavoidable. Uh, and he was, of course, responsible for leading all aspects of the planning and delivery of what was the first World Cup to be held in the Middle East. Quite an achievement. Uh, next to him, 14 hours journey, I believe, right. uh, Eric Johnson. Uh, Previously served in the Texas House of Representatives and is currently the 60th mayor of Dallas, Texas. He's one of the youngest mayors of a major American city. Uh, and then finally, again, an awfully long journey for you. Thank you very much for coming. Jane Castor was the first woman to serve as chief of police of the Tampa Police Department and is currently serving as the 59th mayor of that wonderful city in Florida. Uh, right. Thank you. you. So I'm going to open it up with a, a question that I suspect you will have a view on, I, I hope, from, from different perspectives. But um, given that we are now post-pandemic, officially, uh, what should we expect from in-person sports events this year? And as we sort of go in the years ahead, I know you've all had very different experiences, but perhaps I could start with you on this. Well, I think what we're, we're going to and have been seeing is the growth of these mega events. And the stadiums uh, are getting bigger and bigger. Our, our football stadium uh, handles about 74,000 individuals. Our hockey, 20, um, just over 26,000. But you can only fit so many people in there. So how are we going to provide that experience to the growing fans and to ensure that our sports grow in our community? And I really do think that that is the future of these mega sports is to make sure that we're connecting with the fans in the um, experiences that they want. And those all differ. And it's not just that in-person experience at the stadium. Well, first of all, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here. And thank you so much for, um, for um, having me here today. But, you know, I, I represent um, a city that I would say is, is, Sports crazy. We're sports mad. We love our sports in, in Dallas. And I think that's actually true of our country. The United States is pretty, pretty sports obsessed country. And so uh, I don't just think that the future of mega sporting events is, is bright. I think the future of sports, um, period, is pretty bright from the perspective of, of the United States. Um, and, and really, for three main reasons. Uh, the first, uh, I think, is something that we learned coming out of the pandemic, which is you know, we're social creatures, uh, human beings. We like being around each other. And when we couldn't um, for the, during the pandemic, um, that was hard. And we, and we struggled. And, and our city was no exception to that. And when we were able to get back together again, we did so um, with a lot of fervor. Um, we realized how much we miss um, our sports. And so I think, you know, the, the increasing social isolation, you know, isolation and, and sort of the the, the lack of opportunities to get together generally. Um, you know, the pandemic was a, a really glaring example of that, but you know, so, is, um, so is remote work, and so is um, all the, you know, the, the prevalence of online shopping, that we're losing opportunities to get together, which actually, interestingly enough, I think is driving an interest and in, in, in only gonna help sports and in-person sporting events going forward. I think um, as the world and our certainly you know, you know, countries become wealthier, um, as disposable incomes go up, and I think Sandrine in the last uh, panel talked about this a little bit, um, as people have more disposable income and they have more leisure time, um, they're going to need things to fill that leisure time with, and they're going to have the money to spend uh, on sports and entertainment. I think sports stands to benefit um, from that. And then I think the last uh, thing that I think about in terms of what's driving um, sports and what's going to continue to drive it actually might be bigger than the sports themselves, and that is um, the increasing legalization of, of gambling in the United States and more jurisdictions um, allowing that um, is actually going to drive the, the need for content and for products for people to actually be able to, to wager on. So I think we're only going to see an already sports crazy uh, country get sports crazier. So I, I see um, all of the, the, the winds being blowing uh, in the direction of uh, increasing popularity of all types of sports. I mean, um, we, you know, you had a representative on the last panel uh, who has a cricket team. We're building a cricket stadium. It's going to be the largest in the United States um, in the Dallas area. So 
um, pretty much every, every sport I see um, has a, a lot of growth potential in the United States. Um, Eric used the phrase sports crazy. I think, I think that could be applied to Qatar. I think that's a, a, a fair assumption. What's, uh, what's your view? I mean, you've organized one of the world's biggest events. How do you see it going forward? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to start by saying thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. It gives me great pleasure to be here with you and to be able to share some insight with our friends and colleagues uh, from the United States. They'll be hosting the 2026 World Cup. And I have to say that, um, in my opinion, uh, the Middle East is a specifically football, soccer, sports uh, crazy um, region. And I know that it's the, growing, it's the fastest growing sport uh, um, in the United States right now. Well, I think now it's competing with paddle. I don't know if paddle is growing in, <laughs> in the U.S., but definitely yes. in this part of the world it is. Um, and I know that yeah, football, soccer, um, in terms of Little League, is the, is the biggest sport. And so something needs to, to happen between Little League and, and university to see why it, it doesn't continue. Um, but it's, what's interesting is that's happening here um, in the context of uh, COVID. We were the first major global sporting event to take place in a post-pandemic world. And we were, we were glad to see and have it behind us by that time. But we saw that people were hungry for sports. We saw that people really, um, there is something innate in people that just makes them uh, gravitate towards sport. The future of sport is very challenging. I mean, uh, you, the panelists before us spoke about creating content, becoming more engaging. And what's happening with sports is similar to what's happening with, with how people consume news. There's so much competition between sports, it's becoming more global, it's becoming more accessible. And, you know, sports, news, entertainment are all competing for people's attention right now. The other thing that's happening with sports is sports are becoming bigger and bigger. And if we look at the World Cup, they've increased from 32 teams to 48 teams. It makes it very challenging for countries to host these mega events. And now only bigger countries like the US can host 48 teams because they can spread them amongst many cities and, and smaller countries where the sport is big, um, it becomes a lot more challenging for them. But, so I think these are some of the challenges for major sporting events uh, going forward. But what we see also is interest is growing in the NBA, interest is growing in the NFL and different parts of the world. So they're also thinking about how to globalize a sport that was traditionally a one, one country sport. I mean, there's interest in in football in Argentina and England and so forth, but now it's becoming global. Um, so this is how I see the, the future of sport. I did want to touch on something, because a lot of the focus is always on the economic side of, of sport, but I'm also interested in the, um, I suppose, the cultural, the social, the political ramifications of these things. Um, Eric, perhaps we could start with you and your thoughts on that and how you think about it in terms of, you know, your current position. So... I think that sports has an ability to uh, bring communities together, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, that was referenced in the previous panel. It's true. I mean, such an important part of uh, sports is uh, communities coming together to have something um, in common to cheer for. I mean, and again, we're running out of, we're, I feel like we're not gaining more opportunities to come together as a society. Um, we're losing them. Uh, it, it, sort of in the name of convenience and you know, with all the technological advances, which are so great, you know, everyone's got an iPad or a tablet, and everyone's got a, a smartphone, and they can do all their shopping um, from home, and they can work from home. Um, we, we need more from the perspective of a mayor. Um, when you're trying to mobilize a community to do great things, you're, you're, you're trying to um, grow a city, um, you're looking for opportunities for, for um, folks to come together. So, uh, and, and Mayor Cash is a perfect person to have on this panel with me because, for example, it's not, it's not for no reason that every time one of our professional sports teams is, is in a championship game or a conference final that we do these mayoral right. wagers. We actually um, will we'll bet something um, with each other, and the media picks up on it every time, and it gets widely reported because... What we're trying to do is we're trying to give our residents something um, to come together around and to be excited about and to take pride in being from Dallas or take pride in being from Tampa. And, and, and it really does contribute to a sense of belonging to a community and taking pride in it. So these efforts to attract these um, large 
you know, events like a, a World Cup, it brings our whole community together because we have to sell our city and we have to sell our, our region, our part of the world. And so um, you really can't even buy the kind of uh, civic pride that comes from an effort to attract a, a World Cup final, which is what we're trying to do. We know we're going to get a, a game. Um, and there is, and as you mentioned, there is an economic benefit to that. I think they're estimating that you know, every game brings like $400 million in, of economic impact per game. So that's, that's pretty significant. But really, the real lasting benefit of the effort is it brings our community together. And it shows us that we can come together for a World Cup, which means we can come together for a bunch of other things, too, that have lasting significance for our community. So it's, it's bigger than just the game itself, for sure. And I couldn't agree with that more, especially when you look not only in our country, but around the world with the, the political divisiveness uh, there is nothing that brings people together like a sporting event. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. You are going to cheer for your home team. And we won recently a Super Bowl and two um, Stanley Cups. And, I mean, those are just – I know. I didn't. I didn't want to bring that up, but, but we you did. did. We did win. We did win the bet. But even then, you talk about culturally and just keeping it within the United States right now, but also to talk about it globally uh, in just a second. You know, if if you look culturally to Texas and Florida, the two hottest states in the United States, there is no snow. That well, sometimes in Texas, there is no ice. But we are rabid hockey fans. I've never been on ice skates in my life. And just, you know, just the way that that brings you in and to be able to to share that, that culture that comes with that. Um, and also, when you look at it globally, you know, when you talk about soccer that we we uh, refer to as others refer to as football, you know, that too comes with a different type of culture and a different type of fan base that we can, we can learn about other countries. And again, just shortens that distance between cultures, between nations, between political parties to bring everyone together to cheer for their hometown team. And that's what you've, you've done this on a scale <laughs> that I think is almost unimaginable. In terms of the soft power piece of this, how do you think about it? Well, I think depending on the country that's hosting this mega event and depending on its objectives and where this country is in its history, um, they can use mega sporting events to, to drive political agendas, to drive social change, to drive economic change. And I think Qatar was positioned in a way back in 2009 when it won. Um, first of all, Qatar was known for, for a country for its oil and gas. So um, I think there's a lot more that it, it, it can deliver. A part of the national vision, which was put in place in 2008, a 30-year vision was put in place in 2008. And in 2009, Qatar won the rights to host the World Cup. So obviously, the first thing that we looked at was, how do we drive and accelerate progress to be able to achieve this vision? And a lot of it had to do with infrastructure development. A lot of, a lot of it had to do with the diversification of the economy. A lot of it also was uh, driving towards a more sustainable future, whether that's environmental, whether that's social. And we said, how can this World Cup contribute to this vision? And it became more than a sporting event. It, had, it took another dimension of becoming this, this massive event that people in Qatar rallied around. On the soft power, we saw that it worked against Qatar because for one reason or the other, which many people in this room you know, were witness to, Qatar was attacked over 10 years um, on issues such as um, migrant welfare, uh, workers' welfare. And you know that these are, these are issues that many countries deal with, but Qatar being a small country, Qatar being a country that many people considered was not a traditional footballing country, um, felt that there was a need to, to, to highlight these points. And, we saw that it accelerated a lot of social change. It accelerated a lot of um, ex uh, economic uh, diversification. And this, this gave this World Cup this opportunity to become um, a point of dialogue, a point of um, um, issues that can be raised. And for, for us, I think this took a very, very um, strange dimension. And, and it helped people of the region, not only Qatar, rally around this World Cup because people felt that um, this was speaking um, and reflecting the region and speaking on, on behalf of the region. 
So it was it was at a global stage, um, um, a global size in terms of the sporting event, but also in terms of the dialogue. And a lot of the issues that were discussed around the Middle East that came to the forefront and really brought it towards an audience that doesn't really discuss political issues because they focus mm -hmm. on sports traditionally. I, I should ask, since, since we're all here, Dallas, as, as we know, is, is, is going to be a host city of the 2026 World Cup. What advice would you have for Eric, given, yes, given your what experience? What advice would you have for Eric? <laughs> well, I mean, to, to both the honorable mayors that are, that are with me here on the panel, I think you really need to define what your city or your state wants to achieve. And I think Qatar really wanted to become a, a, a hub for tourism and saw that this is an amazing opportunity. Uh, the advertising value that the World Cup brought and the communication value that the World Cup brought uh, was $2 billion. So you need to spend $2 billion to be able to get the kind of exposure yeah. that Qatar got during the World Cup. And for us, the, the objectives were clear. In 2009 was to accelerate all the infrastructure development. In 10 years, we saw brand new airport, brand new port, um, um, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of highways that were put in place, metro system. And really, these are all tools of communication and tools of, of, of um, improving trade. Tourism was a big part of it. So if Dallas wants to improve its tourism uh, uh, um, offerings, or if it wants to really um, be known, not just as a, as a, as a state that you know, has a lot of you know, Exxons and, and, and oil and so forth, um, Dallas is a beautiful city, and Dallas really wants to improve on its tourism. How do we utilize the World Cup and really work on making sure that they can attract people from not only the United States, but internationally? Um, which means that is there a way that Dallas or, or Texas or the other host countries, host cities, can they influence easing the visa approval process for people who have tickets to, to come to the World Cup? Um, if a state wants to really improve on its infrastructure and wants to, they need to, they need to think about where they, st they stand. For us, we drove the environmental agenda here. We said that this needs to be the most sustainable World Cup ever. We generate 800 megawatts of solar energy right now. And did the World Cup have anything to do to accelerate this? Yes, it did, because it was a commitment that we made in 2009. So these are just, these are just some examples of what we achieved outside the realm of sports. Well, that, 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 that's interesting. That, that brings me on to the, sort of the next question, which is back to the, the economic aspect of it, I suppose. But um, when you're thinking about these events, uh, as a question for all of you, what, what strategies are you thinking about to, to get the maximum leverage economically in terms of development? How do you think about it? Well, you can think about the event itself, or, you know, as was stated, you have to... Uh, you have to decide what that overarching goal is. And for us, on a much, much smaller scale with hosting uh, Super Bowls or uh, Stanley Cup playoffs, for us it was to, to put our community up on the world stage and show what we had to offer. Uh, we don't have any issues with tourism. You know, we have a, a lot of tourists in the Central Florida area with Orlando, Tampa, St. Petersburg, uh, beaches, um, uh, entertainment locations, but also to show that what an incredible city we have in Tampa. With the NFL, we hosted a Super Bowl 55 in 2021, right during the, the pandemic coming off of that. And so there were a lot of issues associated with that. We were able to have all of the events associated with the NFL, the NFL experience, um, the entertainment, the cuisine. We were able to have that along our Hillsborough River, which winds right through the middle of our town. So we had the opportunity to show what an incredibly gorgeous city that we live in. But then we were also able to, um, to attract businesses, uh, to our diverse economic portfolio. We literally had businesses and individuals that moved to our city uh, just because they went to, to the Super Bowl. And they said, we had no idea. Show off our, our port, one of the largest in the nation and geographically, import-export, our incredible airport. All of the things that we had that we could share with the world. And you have to be incredibly intentional about it. You can't you can't assume that everybody is going to see that when they get to your city. And you have to think about how many different ways you can deliver that message uh, through social media experiences, uh, through the news coverage, 
through sports, through individuals that come to visit and take that word back. And so there's a great deal of effort that goes into putting on these large scale events that don't just associate with a ground level, making sure that it's, it's uh, safe for the patrons, uh, the fans to, to go to, making sure that it runs on time, all of that. There are so many other aspects that you have to take advantage of because it's one-time opportunity. Eric, it's a similar theme. How do you sustain that momentum? So if you Google this, you'll, you'll, you'll see that this is a, a, a true statement. Um, there are more hotel rooms, hotels, under construction, aggregate number, in Dallas, Texas, right now, than any place on planet Earth. That's a fact. I don't think it's coincidental um, th that we're competing um, for a World Cup final, and that's a true statement. I think that those two things are, are related in some ways. Um, my point is, is that the process, the, the, the actual competition itself um, for these large sporting events, if you really think about it from the perspective of a mayor, a leader of a, of a municipality, a, a leader of a, of a metro area or a region, it's not really about sports at all at, at the end of the day. Um, these are checkups on the health and vitality of your community. Because in the process of competing, not only do you find out what you're really great at and what you're marketing yourself as, you find out what you're not so great at and where you're losing the competition. So you find out how short you are on hotel rooms compared to other major cities. You find out how lacking you might be in certain types of infrastructure. How wired is your city? How connected is your city? You find out about the mobility challenges of your area. You find out in a metro area like the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area, um, where there are gaps in uh, transportation needs and how hard it might be to get from Arlington, Texas, to Dallas, Texas, to Frisco, Texas, and, and around the Metroplex, and you have to address those or you don't win. But the, the, the net benefit of the process is you had to build it and do it to compete. Whether you win the game or not, that infrastructure is there. It's in the ground once you've built it. That mobility has improved. Those hotel rooms exist. And so you win even when you lose, um, when you do it the right way, which is when you are responsive to the competitive process and you do all of the things that you need to do to, to compete well. So um, again, I, I've been playing sports and, and, and been a sports fan uh, my whole life. I love sports. And I think, like I said, it's, a, it, it's got all the wind at its back right now. And I think that sports are only going to continue to get more and more popular in the United States for all the reasons I said before. But from the perspective of civic leaders, folks who you know, run cities, who are trying to grow economies and, and create quality of life for real people, um, the people who live here in, in Doha and people who live here in Qatar benefit still from having had that game and for having had those games. And that's what we're really trying to accomplish here. So yes, we love our teams. And yes, we're all excited about the Dallas Cowboys and about the Dallas Mavericks and the, all these great sports franchises in their, in, their, in their storied histories and what it does for civic pride, but there are real lasting um, benefits. Our, our residents drive on those roads and benefit from that connectivity, and those hotel rooms continue to generate hotel occupancy taxes that help us offset uh, our need to tax our own residents. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you can charge visitors a tax that's less than you have to charge the people who live in your town to deliver the, the real goods and services we have to deliver every day. That's yeah. police protection, fire protection, mm -hmm. water service, in some cases electrical, um, so, you know, electricity services, um, you know, trash pickup, all those things that make a city great, we have to pay for it somehow, and, and winning these types of events helps us do that. So it's a, it's a real win-win for us. And I'd like to add to that, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, the things that were left behind in our community continue to pay value each and every day. But I think as leaders, and Nasser, you probably have a, a, a great answer to this, you also have to think about what, how do you continue to monetize that into the future? Have you overbuilt the hotel rooms and they're not going to be occupied? 
So those are considerations when you go for these larger events too, is that you do want to improve on the levels with the infrastructure, with the connectivity, um, with the, the hotel rooms and so forth. But where is that, that sweet spot where you haven't gone too far and now it's going to be a, a little more of a, a detriment to your community? That's why I want to give you the final word on this. Again, you yep. have the experience here. Sure, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have being such a small country and expecting between 1.2 and 1.5 million fans is how are we going to accommodate this many fans? And also there was a challenge that this World Cup took place in November and December. We were also concerned with, is it the right time of year for the traditional World Cup fans to be coming to, to Qatar? We had um, 1.28 million fans, so it was within the uh, target that we've set. And we knew that we needed close to 98,000 rooms to be able to cater to all those fans. We had 50, at the time of, of winning the, the right to host the World Cup, we had 36,000 rooms. So you could see the gap was huge and it was tremendous. And then we had a whole issue with legacy. What do we do if we build so many hotel rooms? What happens, what happens to them then? So we tried to find a sweet spot between hotel rooms, existing apartments and accommodation, and temporary. And, you know, I think... Looking at the hotel rooms that have been built with the plans of, 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 of tourism, we should be able to, if we capitalize on this World Cup correctly, we should be able to, to utilize these hotel rooms for tourism six months out of the year. And one last thing and one word of advice, which I think we did here very, uh, very well, FIFA attract their own accredited media. So these are media that are really focused on the sport. They go into the stadiums, they go into the media centers, they report on the sport. We would be wrong to assume that they care about reporting on the city. So we took an active approach of inviting media, creating all the facilities that exceeded the facilities that were provided to them by FIFA. We created tours, we created all sorts of activities around that. We created um, a, an extensive program for them just to make sure that the host country was reported on as much as the World Cup. And I think this was one of the main elements and this was one of the main projects that we, that we really worked on um, and we recognized. Good. Thank I'm you. A, yes. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you thank to our you. panel.